Doctor Who podcast. I'm Charles Skaggs. In me in the tard with me in the TARDIS this time, as always, my partner in time, Jesse Jackson. Hey Charles, how you doing? I'm doing great. So uh, we're halfway through the new season? Did I do my math right? You did your math right. We're already halfway through the ser- series ten, just like that. So, I know. Yeah. Yes. I, I want to uh, take the TARDIS and go back to the beginning and uh, watch, like, and but also pretend like I hadn't seen them all yet, so that I could enjoy them all over again. Well, you just said, yeah, you just maybe you need to just wipe your memory, yes. or or just imagine that in the spirit of this episode, maybe it never happened. It's not real. Okay, something to and think just, about. Just pretend that it's start, you're starting all over again. Absolutely. Exactly. So what we're going to talk about today, kids. Uh, we're going to talk about episode 83 for of Next Stop Everywhere, uh, Extremis, which is a reference or referring to um, the aforementioned sixth episode of series 10, uh, written by Stephen Moffat, showrunner, directed by Daniel Netheim. And uh, curious to, about your thoughts about this one because uh, this one was not your typical. Doctor Who episode. So I'm curious your, about your reaction to this one. So I've watched it twice. You know, I, I always watch it on Saturday night, no matter what family obligations and stuff. Um, you know, I always watch it after everyone's gone to bed, and that's why I don't get to tweet with you. And I always read your tweets afterwards so I'm not spoiled. And then uh, normally we record on Sunday morning, so I get up Sunday mornings and I watch it again. Right. Um, I liked it more the second time. Good. But I, I feel, and and part of this is, I've done some exploring online, so we'll talk about this a little bit later. But without reading anything online, my expectation was, do we have another, like the story we're seeing isn't really the story we're seeing. Oh, there's this shocking reveal at the end. It feels like a trope that we've gone to too many times, especially Stephen Moffat. And it it felt like, okay, you know, Stephen, we were having such a good, solid season of just good stories. And why do you want to trick it up? You know, a, a baked potato, you know, um, you know, a baked potato with all the fixings, a steak and a salad is a basic meal. You don't need mushroom cream sauce or, you know, uh, this zucchini souffle or all this, you know, it just so I was a little frustrated. I can so tell. T- tell me your feelings. <laughs> yes, I really am. I'm, I'm going to stop because yeah. I could keep rambling on. That's okay. Well, that's, you know, hey, this is why we're here. This is what we do here on Next Stop Everywhere. We rant like there's no tomorrow. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you on that because, um, well, it's just Moffat's nature. He loves these overly intricate stories. And I think that it's just he he – I appreciate the fact that he doesn't want to dumb things down for the viewers. Absolutely. The, and, and you know, so I appreciate that because I don't like – I don't want pandering. Right. But on the other hand, um, as you said, we did have 
a very nice run of very straight fa- straightforward Doctor Who stories. Which are not – I mean, which were good. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go back to the food analogy. Um I'm going to guess your rating's a little low on this one. Yeah, it is. I, I, we may change after. But, like, um, you know, one of my favorite entertainers is Penn and & Teller. And Penn Gillette was on a cooking show. And they were doing – they had to do a wing. You know, it was a competition cooking show, and they had to do hot wings. And everyone was doing all these exotic um, flavors and elaborate recipes. And he went with a normal – just straightforward, you know, buffalo hot wings. Um, And the judges said, the problem with this recipe is everyone knows what it's supposed to taste like. And if you miss it, they're going to be disappointed. Versus if you go something really exotic and you miss it, they can go, well, I wasn't sure what's supposed to do. And in this competition, you hit it perfect. It was, it was a perfect hot wing. It had just the right enough size, spice, and you know. So, and that's how I felt like these first five episodes were. They were classic episodes. You know what you're wanting, but when they're executed so strongly, you're like, okay, this is the Doctor Who I love. This yeah. is. You know, this is Sting doing, you know, (laughs) police songs, Bruce Springsteen doing, you know, his hits. It is just such a joy. Take a drink. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And and so and I'm not and I think that's part of it. I'm I'm watching this with um, my sunglasses of, you know, not rose colored sunglasses, but um, tired of this elaborate you know, plot sunglasses. Not not your Sonic sunglasses? No, I though I do love the Sonic sunglasses. Every yep. time I wear my sunglasses, I go, they're Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, it's just like you're carrying a, a Sonic screwdriver with you wherever you go. Absolutely. All right, so... Um, Am I being a little harsh? I don't know. Um... The, the reason I, I, I put that little caveat out there that yeah. I'm about not knowing is that, from what I understand, this is part one of a three-part story. Okay. Uh, the next two episodes, uh, The Pyramid at the End of the World and The Lie of the Land, okay. um, are still coming up. So we haven't really gotten to the end of the story yet. And so, also, so I'm, I'm willing to kind yeah. of reserve a little bit, keeping that in mind, but... Uh, yeah. So far, mm-hmm. so far, yeah. There, there was uh, this. I mean, obviously, this is, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's a stark contrast to what we've had so far. But, uh, but uh, I'm willing, hopefully, to, you know, to be patient and see where it plays out, how this plays out. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Charles. And um, as we talk more about the details, we'll talk about the things I liked and everything. Um, because there were some really good parts of this episode, and um, I I don't I like when Doctor Who tries something different. I'm okay with that. I guess I was just lulled into this man. We're going to have a really solid, you know, f- um, this final season of Stephen Moffat. He's just going to, you know, he he's sticking to his ground game as we keep mixing metaphors, right. right? They're just running the ball and they're grinding down the clock and they're chewing up yardage to to get a win versus trick plays or, you know, throwing the bomb. Yeah, so I think so yeah, I think that um you were just enjoying the back to basics approach. Yes. And then now here we are, Moffat pulling out his his usual um tricks. And also if our listeners will remember, historically, I am not happy with two-parters. Right. <laughs> you know. Well, here I, we have a three-parter. So yeah, we'll, yeah, exactly. So. so we'll see how it goes. But, All right, uh, Charles. So right, enough so. ranting. We'll talk more as we get further into the story. All right. So my first topic I want to talk about for Extremis. Um, let's see. What is it here? Oh, yeah. What is real? How do you define real? Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. 
which is a reference to, of course, The Matrix, the 1999 classic, which I just recently watched, so it's kind of stuck in my head, and which, of course, had this virtual world that questioned reality. And uh, so this is where I'm gonna I want to talk about uh, the Doctor and um, the monks and uh, this whole the Veritas plot. So, um, so, so obviously we have the doctor, um, he's now blind, still blind, not quite sure why he hasn't traveled around time and space to fix his eyes. I also think his explanation on why he hasn't told Bill why right. he's blind was a little wishy-washy and kind of, you know, a hand wave. Right. However, you, you skipped, um... I was looking forward to your, you know, the guy who played the Pope has been in a previous Doctor Who episode. Oh yeah, that's true. We have, I forgot. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 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 We did, yeah. We did. You're right. We did skip the um, the guest cast this week. Okay. So, yeah, thanks for reminding me. So, okay. in addition to Michelle Gomez returning as Missy, yay, and Jennifer Hennessy returning as Moira, yes, boo. <laughs> you could, yeah. Uh, Mother is really clueless, by the way. Yeah, she gotta, is. I, I just have to say about Bill's sexuality, I really, unless she's just pretending to ignore. Yeah. But uh, or pretending I, to not catch on. I like that scene, and if that's going to be a later topic, I'll hold it for now. So, is that a later topic when we're talking uh, about no, Bill? No, no, no. Well, we can. I mean, we'll we'll talk about Bill. Okay. But, so, okay. So good. We, All right. I'll save, save it. We can save I'll it. Save it. I'll table it, as we say in business Ta talk. Oh, look at you. <laughs> the suit. Yes. All right. Uh, but yeah, the what you were referring to, uh, Joseph Long, who played the Pope in this episode, uh, he was actually in a previous Doctor Who story, uh, Turn Left, which had, you know, Catherine Tate as Donna Noble. It was during the David Tennant era. And uh, he played Rocco Calasanto in Turn Left. So that's a, that's nice that he get to see him again, and uh, we also had another actor, uh, Ivano Jeremiah, who plays Rafondo, who's the guy that um, is overseeing Missy's, and I'm using this in air quotes, execution. He was good. Yeah. I, I like that. Um, when we get it to that sequence, I'll share what I thought about that, and I have some questions for you. Right. And then who was the one who played the uh, cardinal? Or the Pope's assistant. I thought he was good too. Uh, I'm not sure. I can't. I don't have the okay. cast list in front okay. of me. But uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but you enjoyed his performance. Yeah, I did. I thought that was nice. I actually thought um, the Vatican was a nice change of pace. Like, oh, of course, the you know he would have been you know because we've seen the Doctor being involved with royalty, especially you know in England. But I thought it was really cool to see him, you know, having a past experience with the Vatican and that kind of stuff. So that was good. Okay. So if you're wondering where you saw Ivano Jeremiah. Okay. Um, he's on the uh, series Humans. Ah. He, he plays Max on Humans. Oh, yes. So, okay. So, good. Uh, so if, yeah, that's kind of a nice little – if you're a fan of uh, the show Humans, that's where you've seen – you've probably okay. seen him before. All right. Great. All right. So now – Back to the first topic. Yes, what thank you. Real. Yes. How to, and um, so yeah, the doctor, uh, he's blind, as we as we as I said, and um, he's determined to keep his enemies from learning about his disability. He's determined to keep it from Bill. But he's failing miserably at keeping this under wraps. I think. He is horrible, Charles. And and this did give me um, when you if I take away my frustration of the change of story, you know, kind of tenure of the season, the uh, not not tenure, the tone of the season. Right. Um I love Nardle. Why yes. He is here right in front of you. Oh, yeah. this title is in – look, Doctor, it's in very broad letters. I mean, this, he is the yep. worst at hiding, you know, it, this showing – trying to cover for the Doctor. And the Doctor is – 
you know, we've seen that movie. We've seen that movie where someone is trying to pretend that they can still see each other. You know, there was this, uh, the Four Feathers. There was this guy where he, you know, he talked about his sight coming back at the end. And and so, and the Doctor's just horrible at this. It made for very funny. I, I, I don't understand it. I do like how the Sonic... Um, Sunglasses. Yeah. Now, if he can't see, how can he see the digital readout? <laughs> So I assume well, that's that, going that, directly that's, into his brain. I was just going right. to say, yeah, yeah, it's probably being fed directly into his, his, yes. his brain to re perceive these images. Right. But again, if he's doing that, why doesn't he have something a little better? I, I don't know. There has to be that t all of time and space. All of time and, and space. Keep in mind, he has all of time and space to keep to access. Yes. And he can't find anything better. And he also remember. It's also he... a time machine. Right. So going into the future where they should have uh, technology, it's a spaceship so you can go all in the world, universes. There's no way you can go. And then we had the whole kind of – So again, uh, I, have to, I have to wonder if he is either completely faking this. Yes. And he can actually see. Mm-hmm. Or – because he is so bad at it. Yeah. So if he's trying to be deliberately bad at it, so mm -hmm. then to kind of throw his enemies off. Right. And, but, uh, or or that just it's this massive plot hole. Yeah, and is it just one of those things where they're saying um, a hand wave that, you know, for the purpose of the story, we just need him to be blind. Um, though I don't understand it a little bit. And he's and he's and he's draw, apparently able to draw from the future to give himself temporary sight. But to see that was which, just which, that was then, it, that was in the Matrix, so that didn't really happen. And um, I kind of was a little bit irritated with that statement. You know, I've borrowed against my future. You know, to get this, so that means will will I never regenerate again? Will I die in twenty minutes? Will all my regenerations be blind? You know, that's a very vague question and. Really, you're going to you're going to go to a loan shark because you want to get a hamburger happy meal. Right. <laughs> you know, just it seems this is an extreme thing he's doing to just um, be able to read this document. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. This, okay. the, I hope there's more going on. Yes, I do too. Because if there's not. It's really dumb. Yes. In my absolutely. Opinion. Yeah, I yeah. right there with you. Yeah, so hopefully there's more going on. So, so see, uh, when we were talking about Nardo, my rating yeah. was going up. And, and now, now we talk about the biotech back down. <laughs> well, hopefully we can get it back up when we, okay. when we talk about Nardo. Again. Okay. All right, so, um, so we get the introduction of these characters called the Monks. Mm -hmm. And Stephen Moffat seems to have like this fascination with monks or something because we had the the headless monks, and now in classic Doctor Who, uh, the William Hartnell era, we had this character who was the first rogue Time Lord introduced in the series, the meddling monk. Okay. Back, dur back during the William Hartnell era, and so yeah, there's monks are, seem to be all over the. But then we had those kung fu monks in yeah. um, uh, the. Oh, the David Tennant era story. I'm blanking on the title for some reason. But uh, it was like the, the one right after. It was like the second episode or something in okay. uh, series two. But um, yeah, you guys know the title. I'm blanking on the yeah, title. For some um, he will – he does seem to love um, monks. It's kind of one of his go-to things along with, you know, overly complicated – um, you know, story reveals. Right. Um, but I, if you so do, so do you think they have they're re any relation to the headless monks, perhaps, or not? I don't know. It's, um, I think kind of like the. They used to joke that the writing staff of Lost 
right? had major daddy issues, and that's why the characters had so many dad issues, parent yeah, issues. Yeah. So you wonder if Stephen was really treated bad at Catholic school in his youth, and monks <laughs> taught him, and therefore he has this love-hate relationship with him. Um, I like the villains. I, I'm, we may get to that later, but I thought they were interesting, and I thought they looked good visually, and I am okay that we didn't get a lot of information about them. But it was enough that set me up. That was a good part of the episode for me. See, I thought they looked great. Yeah. Um, had no problem with the monks. Either. But uh, again, it's only part one of the of the trilogy. Right. So hopefully we'll get more about them. Yes. But uh, apparently they are this uh, this whole thing turns out to be this big misdirection that essentially it's like practice for an invasion. Yes. Right. And that's that's the ultimate reveal, which, again, help, I think probably helps make this episode feel a little cheap. Yes. Because, well, hey, you know, like we were expecting like this, you know, story, and oh, guess what? It's just it's practice. And it's practice, man. I'm just talking about practice. And if we, if this had not happened, so many other times in so many other TV shows. Right. Um, another trope that I'm, we talked about recently on this show is the showing something shocking and then going six hours later or 24 hours earlier, you know, they go back and yes. then kind of show you how to get there. Okay. We've, you know, yeah, the, the first well, couple well, of times. Moffat, Moffat loves that, 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 uh, specific play out of his playbook as well. Yes. He loves to like, okay, jump right in and then go like, oh, Let's go back and find out how we got here. Yeah. So and he loves to go to that as well. That's one of his little his, – right. his, the tricks in his, uh, in his bag. Yes. All right. So um, the doctor, as we, we find out at the end, um, you know, he's – I want to say that, um, you know, we, we – uh, He's, he ends up sending it like he, that he realizes he's a virtual um, copy of himself yes. in this story. So he sends a message to his real self. And I did kind of like the, the message is like, hey, you know, whatever, the like little hugs and kisses, you know, like yeah. the doctor, which I thought was kind of funny. It was. But, but um, so obviously the presumably the doctor is going to use this information that his virtual self created. Mm -hmm. But I have to wonder though, how they were, how they, they got such a, a, a great copy of the doctor to create digitally. Um, that is, or, or unless, unless they yeah. just like, unless somehow he walked through some scanner. Well, and for that matter, how did they get a full copy of the whole world? Right. Cause you have Nardo and you have Bill and Bill was acting very, um, yeah. Real and uh, well, Nardo all these, was all the all these other locations like the yeah. White House. Yeah, and, and um, one of the things the that Pentagon. I thought was really interesting, the Pentagon, but also like the Large Hadron Collider. Yes, which which is like oh I knew that thing was up to no good. Yeah, I knew there was something going on with that thing. <laughs> yes, and I tweeted that last night that um, in CERN um, mm -hmm. that uh, yeah these and these people are like you know. It was very. I mean, they had them. These these digital copies seemed to be aware that they were digital copies and were willing to kill themselves to get out of that that virtual realm. Yes, and that is will come to play in one of our quotes of this uh, episode. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, anything else about the doctor in this episode? You know, um, I will talk about we'll talk about the doctor Missy later. Okay. Good. Then. Um, no, I think that's the big thing. Um, yeah, I, I want to talk about him and Missy, and I want to talk him and Bill, and so, and actually him and Nardal. So, yeah, let's we'll move on. Okay, all right. So let's move on uh, to the second topic I have. Okay. Um, I get by with a little help from my friends. Yay. Little uh, 
Beatles classic. I'm yeah. a little geeked. I'm geeking out on Beatles music right now because Sirius XM has the Beatles channel that went live on Friday. Yes, and uh, first song played trivia. I don't know the first song because I was uh, in work. I wasn't either, but someone tweeted. Okay, all we need is person? all we need is love. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. A lot of people were suggested thinking that it might be the first song they played on Ed Sullivan hitting the right. U.S., but All You Need Is Love is a better choice. I always think they would have gone with number nine because the Revolution number nine because they started that thing at 9.09 for yeah. a reason. Oh, yeah. Very nice. Good. So I would have gone with Revolution number nine. Little beat trivia for our thing. Now back to Doctor Who. Yeah. That was our – thank you for yeah. our Sirius XM Beatles <laughs> channel commercial. And now exactly. back to Charles and Jesse talking Doctor Who. <laughs> Uh, we'll be expecting our check in the mail, guys. Exactly. Just, yes. just saying. How about a, how about a little uh, love back? Just since we helped pl- pimp you there, serious. Um, so okay. So obviously this is about Missy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the doctor and Missy. Once again, the apparently we see. We're not quite sure what happened as after we last saw Missy, uh, on the Dalek homeworld Scaro. Right. In the, at the end of uh, The Witch is Familiar last season. Mm-hmm. But um, somewhere between there, that story where she's about to be exterminated and just realizes, oh, I just thought of something. And somewhat at that point and he, this point here, she gets captured and brought in for execution. And we get – we we – Apparently, get the the revelation that she's the one in the vault, yes. as we suspected. Right. As most most everybody suspected, I think. And by the way, in an interview, Stephen Moffat was asked, "Why are you revealing this so early?" And he said, um, "I thought it was the time, and also I knew Doctor Who fans would already have guessed it's Missy by episode three. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. And he, he was right. Yes, and he, he was. was. Right. Yeah. Um. So Charles. Raising my hand to ask the question. Yeah. Um, do we know who these keeper of deaths and this um, ra- alien race that specializes in execution is? No. Okay. Absolutely not. These are brand new characters. <laughs> okay. Um, just so, brand new because you know, just uh, just someone new that that Stephen Moffat whipped up because hey. We need more questions. We don't have it. We don't have enough. Well, so so we have no idea who these guys are. How would they have caught? Yeah, how they would caught Missy? Why they're the ones that feel uh, obligated to put her on trial? Why they felt that? Well, I guess apparently they feel that a time lord has to be present. That could be the laws of their society, I guess. Right. Because they're killing someone of another race, so that other a representative of that race has to be the executioner. But so this was a good segment. Okay. I mean, in fact, in a lot of ways, I call this a great segment. Um, the first off, um, we had a very Game of Thrones looking scene in the boat and or made going through the river sticks, you know, right. to the other side. Um, so I thought that was a cool visual. And then um, – I actually thought maybe the doctor was going to be executed. I and, did too. For okay, what, the, okay. The, but then they flipped it. Right. So okay, I um, I kind of got that impression too. It's like, well, is the doctor being executed? And then Missy I, I think was maybe going the to be, doctor thought he was being executed. Yeah. And then you know Missy was going to be the witness, and then they switched it around. Let's just talk away right now. Um, this version of the master. Right. Michelle Gomez, right? It's just amazing. I- I'm okay taking another five minutes. I mean, just okay. her her humor and uh and her speech, um, not quite Julia Roberts going, you know, I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy, asking her to love him, love her. But it is this. I did not get the feeling she was playing the doctor. I think she was honestly and. You know better than I do. The standard myth is that the doctor and the master were very close friends um, right. as children and going to the academy together. And so I thought that scene was really well done. Um, 
She's I, a lot more serious than we traditionally see Missy. Yes. And she seemed to be really um, – I mean, she makes this big flowery speech yes. about f- friendship. Right. No, I, I have to wonder because it is Missy. Like, okay, what what's the play here? What's the scam? Right. What's the what's what's really going on here? Much and, like the um, scorpion getting a ride on back of the frog. Right. It's my nature. Right. Um, exactly. So I, I can see that absolutely. Um, but I kept waiting for Missy to flip this around and um, yeah. the doctor. Mm-hmm. Didn't happen. And once again, we got another um, talk about his 28 years, or I'm drawing a blank, of Off with River Song. Right. You know, their night. On Derillium. Yeah, yeah Derillium. I, I, lo- I do not think it's overdone. I think it's perfectly, it comes up, just I thought you retired to Delirium. And then her look and she goes my condolences i right. thought that was a really nice touch and then moving on um so i, I really liked this she was oddly respectful in that scene. very respectful and um that's why i said she she had her share of quips that's why and i'm talking what about it but she also was um she was coming across as sincere right and once you can fake sincerity, you got it made. So we'll see what happens, right? The next step on uh, Missy's plan. Right. So, okay, so this now begs the question, now that we know that Missy's the one in the vault. Right. Okay. Why does the doctor feel obligated to keep Missy in the vault? Well, he he made a vow as a Time Lord of the House or whatever. They, well, yeah, they, they actually mentioned that he's from the Pridonian chapter. Yes, which was a nice shout out because yeah, we've we've talked about that that he's from this. This is that's the house right. that he's from on um, Gallifrey. Yeah, and um, the uh, yeah he makes this vow, but it's the Doctor. Why would he? I Rule mean, number one: the Doctor lies. Exactly. So why would you do this? Um, and we know what's the big deal about keeping Missy? Why hasn't Missy tried to escape? Right. Why you know just because they seem very cordial. Because remember the doctor brought her dinner or something. Yes, here. and a piano. And, and a piano. I, yeah. So, so in my going? mind, um, it is a gilded cave. It, cage. cage, yeah, it is almost like um, in I Dream of Genie, the inside of the bottle. You know, right. it's, it's this elaborate, beautiful place that he's got her stored in. Tell and... me about I Dream of Genie, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I a little uh, little dated reference there. Barbara right? Eden. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I, I, you know, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know why he's doing this, um, but. Um, it's Moffat, who knows? Yeah, he wanted to, and you know, he made a uh, Nardle. Um, he, he, you know, he made Nardle swear to him. He made a right. vow to Nardle that we're gonna do this together. So, right, right. yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. It's, it just poses more questions to me. So, one of the things I read today, and so I, I do not remember the website. So, I, I'm at. If you guys recognize this and go, hey, Jesse stole this question from blank, blank, blank. I'm yeah. giving credit even though I don't remember the website. They said that the Christmas special, the superhero Christmas special, the return yeah. of Dr. Mysterio, right? Right. Where does that fit in this timeline? Because, you know, it appears that this episode happens fairly after the Husbands of River Song. Yes. And uh, obviously someone has gone to the library and picked up River Song's diary and put it somewhere. Um, so or, or that, you know, that it was given. River Song gave the diary to Nardle. But see, she she had it when she died in the. But that's song. true. Yeah. So she couldn't have given it to him right after unless, she left. Unless the doctor. Well, remember, we saw the doctor. At the end of Silent, or you know, the Forest of the Dead, he yeah. grabbed that diary. Yeah. So maybe he's had it on the TARDIS all this time. Right. Or he put it in. What the theory is, he put it in the library because he didn't want to know future things, and then right. 
a, a later episode, you know, either the 11th or 12th Doctor went back and got it to keep it in the TARDIS, you know. Right. right. So anyway, regardless of that, um, it was, you know, it kind of doesn't feel the like if they were still had the vault, then why were they going off having the adventure – with Dr. Mysterio, and why wasn't Nardle then saying, hey, why aren't you at the vault? So just a little bit. Yeah, no, no it's, it begs the question, why yeah. wasn't the vault such a big deal during the return of Dr. Yes. Mysterio? And I think it's because, the, you know, uh, if we break our rules again, it's because Moffat hadn't figured out that they were going to do right. a vault. Unless, yeah. unless that, um, yeah, the, uh, he, they made that vow right. after the return yeah. of Dr. Mysterio. Yes, so that we'll that see. would make – actually, that would make sense because he says – you know, he tells the ghost, I'm back now. I'm here to protect. You know, you're okay. So, right. Okay. So we'll find out. We still don't really know the deal of what's behind Nardle's resurrection. No, we do not. Which kind of leads me into my third topic. Okay. So that's that's my attempt at a segue there. I, it was a good one. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you. So my third topic – Mama said, knock you out. Right. I'm gonna knock you out. Mama said, knock you out. I'm gonna knock you out. Mama said, knock you out. Which, uh, reference to the LL Cool J hip hop classic. I have to Mama say, I'm loving the musical titles. I mean, I know what? at first you just kind of threw one or two in there, and now yeah. you're working very hard to have every segment, and I appreciate it. All right. So, uh, but yeah, Mama said, "Knock you out." So that um, this is a reference to, of course, Nardle in this story, and I also want to talk about Bill. So Bill and Nardle in this topic. Okay. Um, Do you want to go first? Nard you always let me go first oh, when you bring right. up the topic. Well, well, just um, yeah, Nardle in this story is surprisingly aggressive in this story. He tries to be a bit of a badass uh, in a couple scenes. This and, story. and baby, don't forget. I always am or something. I, I did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He calls her baby. Yeah. Nora yeah. calls yeah. Bill baby doll. Yeah. Don't you forget is, it. Baby doll. Which yeah, is just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just so, um, yeah, he's, he's like that. And then of course, thankfully in the next scene, we see him like all, freaked out by some little critter on the floor or whatever yes. yeah he's like, ah, what's that he gets all this girly scream but um so yeah nardle's uh i mean he plays the fact that we we were talking about missy so let's start there where nardle shows up and he's kind of dressed like a headless monk once again right. we get once another again, monk thing yeah 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 reference to the head because he's got this this big hood over him Kind of like the headless monks wear, right? And um, he shows up. He's got River Song's diary, as we were talking about. And apparently, according to Nardle, he has specific instructions from River to kick the doctor's ass. If he, did, you know. so the question is like, okay, why did River send Nardle of all people? To keep an eye on the doctor. So here's my theory, and it's just purely a theory, is um, I think Nardle and her had bonded over the, you know, time. And when she w knew that she was going off and she suspects that this is her final adventure, you know, she um, – and of course, that doesn't quite fit into when. I mean, I know she was working. He was working for her at the beginning of the husband's right. river song. Yeah, and when she sees uh, the but tenth he was a bit doctor, of, but he was a bit of an idiot then. Right. And now, apparently, not so much. Right. Um. So I, I think she, for some reason, trusts him, and I don't know. Maybe she added some extra memory into his brain you know yeah. uh, upgraded the uh processor um because we aren't sure how human he is and how about robot he is and how you know alien he is um well here, here's a theory what if nardle yes and this is just a wild theory yeah what if nardle is actually an android copy that thinks he's the real nardle mm -hmm. with his head transplanted on a mechanical body mm, okay I, I'm just throwing. I'm just throwing that out there. I I could be totally wrong on that. Yeah. 
but it would kind of explain why Nardal thinks, well, you know, I didn't ask to come back. Yeah. Or like, you know, like I didn't ask to have a body, the, a mechanical body. Right. Because remember, he was he was in just ahead as far as uh, with King Hydroflax mm-hmm. in that in that big robot suit. Yeah. And in the Husbands of River Song. So we still don't know how we've gotten from A to B here. Yeah. There's again more questions that have yet to be answered. So hopefully we'll get some answers here in the next six episodes at least. Yeah. But um, and then Bill in this story, um, I thought that was she had a great moment because um, she brings home a date. Yeah. And a penny. Yeah. And. Um, she comes home, and then Moira shows up because unexpectedly, and Moira thinks she brought a boy home. Yes. And so there's that that nice little like, uh, you know, so Moira starts getting angry with her, like, oh, I thought we set up rules for this, and rah, 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 rah. Mm-hmm. and it turns it like then Penny walks in and she's like, oh, it's a friend. Yeah, and Bill's like, yeah, a friend, yeah. You know, it's it's funny that as many parents, and I know she's a foster parent, but um, do as I say, not as I do, was a thing that my mom would say often, which irritated me as a kid incredibly. <laughs> um, so she's out to meet some guy at the pub, and yes, she's either clueless or just trying to bury it, and I love the... You're talking Moira. Yeah, yeah, Mora, and I, 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 so, but I like how, you know, Bill handled it, and I loved Penny's kind of being nervous and kind of going, and then everything goes to heck in a handbasket, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, and just... It's and then, my and then, pipes, and then, it's my pipes, and sometimes I yell at them, so don't feel weird. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. She's 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 panicking here at this point. It becomes this rom com. Yeah. Where where or like an episode of Three's Company where yeah. Um, again, more dated references to TV shows. Right. Uh, so uh, he or Bill is just scrambling, and then yeah, the doctor shows up in the TARDIS with the Pope of all people. Yes. And you know, like uh, you know, Bill like has to end up like telling the Pope. You know, you're going to hell or something like that, which yes. I thought was funny. Absolutely. Nice little throw, throwing that back, because normally it's like, you know, uh, people that are very anti, religious types that are very anti-gay telling gay people yes. that they're going to hell. So it's right. a, it was an interesting way to flip that back for yeah. once. Um, but, uh, and then Bill ends up partnered with Nardle uh, eventually. As they enter the Matrix, I don't know what else to call this virtual realm, but the right. Matrix at this point, because they don't really give it a name. The Veritas realm, I don't know, yeah. what, what, whatever you want to call it. Right. So we we so we fun, get some more um, Bill and Nardle paired together. Yes. Scenes, which is which is good. I want more of that. I want a spinoff of of yeah. them, and I <laughs> I know. Um, that uh, he's busy doing a late night talk show, but we want uh, the lodger, <laughs> the caretaker. Yeah, you know, we right. want these three together in a room. That's the version of oh, Three's you Company. Meet, like, Craig, you want to meet, let me, meet her? Uh, meet Craig Owens? Yes. From the lodger. Yeah, yeah. That Craig Owens, Nardo, and Bill all in a room. Yeah, That's get, my get, version of Three's Country. That's my you know uh, being human. I mean, this is what's yeah. be great. They need to be roommates. Yeah. Yes, so they like do. A, like a like a like a Doctor Who version of Friends is what you're yes, going for. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But um, so there's one point where um, the do- uh, Nardle, like, Bill's wanting to help the Doctor. She's and Nardle gets all over her. Mm-hmm. He just he tries to get all authoritative and and is like, look, you know, I'm I'm licensed to kick the Doctor's arse. And don't think that I won't do the same to you. And 
which I thought was a really interesting moment. Then, then I, I think that was the moment where he gets all talking, like he's taking off yeah. his glasses and being all serious. Oh, it's so funny. He takes his glasses and he's staring at you. And then when he puts the glasses back on, it's like he becomes Clark Kent again. OK, yeah. you ready to go on? Yeah. And then at that the point, he gets all scared, I think. Yes. Was, so that was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Um, so and then we have Bill the doctor. You wanted to talk about that a little bit. Where yeah. we, we have the doctor blatantly lying to Bill about his disability. Yeah. And obviously, apparently, from the trailers we saw for next week, it comes out next week. Yes. So thankfully, they're not going to drag that out too long. No, I'm hoping not. Because of since the doctor's so bad at it, about, yes. cover, about covering his, uh, yeah. his tracks. But uh, so anything else about Bill and Arnold you want to talk about? Um, I... I love that the doctor calls Bill in the real world. Right. And he remembers what happened, at least some, in the imaginary world. Or somehow he got that because he says, are you on a date? No. Right. Are you sure? So somehow or another he remembers that he's supposed to ask that. And then he asks about Penny way over my league. No, she's not. So the doctor giving her love advice is so wonderful. Like, yeah, you should call her. Right. <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't know. I, I like that a lot. Um, I continue to just love Bill's journey. Um, I will share something that I read um, in the Stephen Moffat interview. He said that he... He says, a common question we ask is, why do these companions keep staying with the doctor when their lives are in danger? And so this time he wanted to show that Bill had had very fun yet stressful adventures. Right. And then by this time she's hooked. And then when the mummies in space happened or the zombies in space, you know, she's already hooked. Because he says, you know, if that had been your first adventure, you'd be like – forget you old man i'm yeah. getting back so i thought that was an interesting point of what his thought was on why the story he was telling that so i thought that was good um i just continue to love bill and i think she's great and it yeah. seems like a lot of other people do uh, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I t obviously i agree i think bill's yeah. a great companion i'm glad people are kind of coming around they really seem to like her and uh and it's very reassuring, like, okay, hey, we don't have to hate companions. We can actually like right. them. What a shock. So um, I think a lot of people are just looking for a great change after Clara because Clara was around for so long. And uh, I think Bill's hopefully that, that breath of fresh air everybody wanted. So um, I guess we're kind of left at the end of the episode yes. where we have the doctor uh, pleading with Missy through the vault doors to help him with real invasion, which is what by the monks. Yeah. And so obviously that's what happens next week. So we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, all right. So let's move on to favorite quotes. And yeah. I'm sure there's a, there's some good lines in this one. So I'll, I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, I will. Where'd my notes go? Where'd my uh, notes go? There they are. Okay. Um, the I love the line where he says, it's like Super Mario figuring out what's going on, deleting himself from the game because he's sick of dying. Right. <laughs> yes. That was good. Yeah. So um, I thought Bill had, had some good quotes in this one. So one of them is uh, where she's, uh, laying into the doctor early on. She mm -hmm. says, when I'm on a date, when a rare and special thing happens in my real life, <laughs> do not, do not, under any circumstances, put the Pope in my bedroom. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, it, it That was so funny and so um, special. Um, and then there's a... Um, there's also a great point when the monk alien is asking the doctor, what are you doing? And he says, what everyone does when the world is in danger, calling the doctor. Right. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that was a great quote. I, I, mm -hmm. I like that, too. Yeah. Um, my next quote I have is uh, Nardle to Bill, the what we just recently talked yeah. about, um, where he's laying into her. He goes, OK, Bill, 
Miss Potts, I'm the only person you've ever met or will ever meet who is officially licensed to kick the doctor's arse. I will happily do the same to you in the event that you do not align yourself with any instructions that I have issued, which I personally judge to be in the best interest of your safety and survival. Okay, Bill? I love that scene. I, I really did. I think it was great. Um, yeah, another quick one was particle physicists and priest. What could scare them both? That's a good one. Yes. That's great. Uh, um, last one I have this week is Nardo again. Yes. So Nardo gets some good lines in this. Yes. But here, but here he's quoting River Song, where he says, "Goodness is not goodness that seeks advantage. Good is good in the final hour, in the deepest pit, without hope, without witness, without reward. Virtue is only virtue in extremis. This is what he believes." And this is the reason, above all, I love him, my husband, my madman in a box, my doctor. Yeah, I, I love that. It was so, so touching and so very River Songish. Right. Um, and so great to see. Absolutely wonderful to see. So once again, River, well, River works his way her way into the story, even though she's not actually into the story. In the story. Yes, that is true. She is. Which again makes me wonder: Are we going to see River Song one last time? Maybe, maybe in the Christmas special. I could hope. I, I would like to see that. that I would, would love. The, the tears will just flow in that yes, one. If absolutely. That, if that happens. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If River figures out one last way to see the doctor, and that right, and Moffat writes her one last time, I think. Yes. All right. Absolutely. Any other quotes you have? Nope. Nope. I am good. You got them. All right. What's your rating for this one? I'm guessing it's a little low. Well. If I if I do it as a whole, yes, I, I would probably do seven seven and a half, okay. you know, um, uh, you know seven and a half sonic um, sunglass emails. Okay. Um, but if I if I forget the fact that it is this alternate reality, I mean, you think of the. Missy and Doctor scenes and, and right. the you know all the scenes with that you know I would give it a much higher eight or nine okay. so but when you look at it whole right yeah. now now I may go back later in two weeks when we've got a triple and we're looking at a whole high but right now I'm going to give it seven and a half okay that's fair uh, I give it a little higher just a little higher yeah uh, I give it eight out of ten stolen laptops ooh nice good yep yeah. so uh, all right so going to move on. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the reverse the polarity. We're going to reverse the polarity so, to the neutron flow. we didn't talk about it. Do we want to share our feedback before we go to reverse the polarity? Uh, Did you not get can. your I was feedback? Gonna, I was going to do that after reverse Okay, that's polarity. fine then. Great. Okay. Okay. Good I thought deal. that would be a better way to end Sounds the great. Okay. episode. So, uh, yeah, I'll just rip, try and get through this as quickly as possible. Oh, no. Take your time. Um, so... We're going to reverse the polarity back to 19. So, so wait a minute. But I want to guess. To, are you as going... I screech to a halt. Yes. Are we Jesse going to. Me, Jesse makes me slam on the brakes. Yes. So I'm trying to think out loud. Are you going to give a monk reference? Yes. Alien alternate universe that may be a memory or something else. Um, I'm going to go. You're going to go with some kind of monk church reference. Charles. Survey says, ding, <laughs> something else. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to reverse the polarity back to 1982 with Castro Valva. Okay. The very first Peter Davison episode. All right. Story. Uh, the first serial of season 19 in 1982, written by Christopher H. Bidmead, uh, the showrunner at the time. And the... Um, I mean, the script editor, excuse me, script editor. Um, so after his regeneration at the end of Legopolis, spoilers, mm -hmm. the, the newly regenerated fifth doctor is still weak and recovering. Uh, his companions, Nissa, Adric, Nissa, and Tegan, take him to the TARDIS uh, to recover. Uh, so inside the TARDIS, the doctor is delirious, but asked to be taken to the Zero Room, which is this room inside the TARDIS that contains Time Lord healing technology to allow him to recover. 
Tegan and Nissa discover that there's a terminal on the TARDIS that des describes how to use the TARDIS console to activate the TARDIS. So they attempt to pilot the TARDIS, but find they are traveling rapidly to a preset time and destination, Event 1, a.k.a. the Big Bang, in a trap mm. set, by, set by the Third Master. Ooh, okay. And now, suddenly a unable to find Adric, the women bring the Doctor out of the Zero Room after um, just out of the Zero Room, uh, just in time for him to jettison a quarter of the TARDIS's mass to get them out of Event 1 and propel them back to conventional time. And unfortunately, this also wipes out the Zero Room in the process because that was in the quarter that was jettisoned. So they end up building a makeshift uh, Zero Cabinet uh, for the Doctor to try to recover in. Okay. And so they end up um, trying to figure out where to take the Doctor. So uh, Tegan ends up discovering the information on this place called the Dwellings of Simplicity on this planet called Castra Valva, okay. which is supposedly an ideal place for the Doctor to recover. And they end up uh, programming the TARDIS to go there. So after they carry the Doctor to the dwellings, this is where we, we kind of get into my the main connection I'm, I'm doing here. Uh, the Doctor gets cared for by Shadowvan, Shardovan, a librarian, okay. and an elder, elderly portrieve. Now, after uh, a night's sleep, they discover that if they go out of the city through any exits, they find themselves suddenly back within the same plaza, no matter which exit they leave from. Mm-hmm. And the doctor ends up realizing that they're trapped in what's called a recursive occlusion, and the dwellings are actually fake. Okay. So we have a fake reality going on here. The portrait, surprise, turns out to be the master, and shows them Adric, who's caught in a web-like structure. Uh, the master has used Adric's mathematical genius to create the dwellings, uh, and create the also created the terminal in the TARDIS console that led them there. So all of this has been a big master trap. And realizing the true nature of Castrovalva's reality, Shardovan destroys the web, freeing Adric and causing the reality of the dwellings to start falling apart. Seeing all that is all is lost, the master flees to his TARDIS, which was disguised as a fireplace. The Doctor and his companions flee from the city. The master appears to be trapped, though, and is unable to escape as the city collapses in on itself. Okay. The time travelers return to the TARDIS, and the doctor indicates, guess what? I'm fully recovered from my regeneration. Mm-hmm. So, so essentially, yeah, we have the master and a fake reality. Okay, nice. So I like it. I, that's where I was going with that. It was a bit of a stretch, but this is No, a, no, this I is, think it's good. Well, and one. you know, you always love... A Peter Davison story. He is your doctor. He is my doctor. Yes, yes he is. Good. Very nice. Uh, sounds great. Um, and so now yeah, hopefully, then. Hopefully, hopefully this is one story I plan to cover later this year on Next Stop Everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right. So you want to, we have yeah, yeah, feedback yeah, again? Totally. Yes, please. Do you want to read or, or You go I? ahead. Okay. Let me pull up the email here. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you for sending that, by the way. Yes. So uh, last week we didn't um, get to cut, talk to uh, or read the email from Holly from Wisconsin. But thankfully, Holly, you're kind enough to write back in. So yes. guess what? We're going to read your email now. So Thank you, Holly. Uh, so these are her thoughts on Extremis. Hey, Charles and Jesse, what an episode. Well, we now know who was in the vault and part of the reason why. I'm sure there's still more to the story than what we know right now. Uh, the group of executioners almost looked like a side sect of the Time Lords, and when the main one looked up the doctor on his wrist computer, he and the other fr his other friends got about as jumpy as the Dalek did when he looked up River Song. So I loved that analogy. So were you were you expecting like them to say mercy, mercy? I, I wasn't, but I was like I did think it was funny because they knew that the doc they knew that time lords regenerate but it still right. looked like they were a little uh, overwhelmed by how often he've gotten out of death traps because as we know from missy stool rule number one 
he decides he's going to survive, right? Exactly. Yes. So Holly continues, I, yes, I was half expecting the word mercy or to have mercy come out of one of their mouths before running away. So Nardle, she says, Nardle showing up as a headless monk and saying that River had sent him to look after the doctor and had permission to kick his ass once of the night's touch. Yes. All in all, a decent episode. Can't wait to see what next week brings. Looking forward to your thoughts on the episode. Holly from Wisconsin. So thank you, Holly, for writing in. Absolutely. Again. Thank and, you. And I'm glad we had time to read your email this week. So absolutely. Great. We are. So um, keep it up. Yes. Keep sending us. And, you know, what was lovely is at the end of last episode, you said, write us again, Holly. And she did. So, yay. Yeah. I well. appreciate that. Yes. Um, so if someone else wanted to give us feedback, how could they, Charles? Well, they could reach us at Next Stop Everywhere at, or excuse me, Next Stop Everywhere SMG at gmail.com. So that's like Next Stop Everywhere, South Meet, Southgate Media Group, abbreviated SMG. Mm-hmm. Um, you could also reach us at Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast on the Facebook or at Next Stop SMG on Twitter, which is always great because we can easily pull those comments off and and uh, get those read. So please, yeah, if you want to be like Holly, please write in. Let us know what you think. And uh, you can also um, find us on iTunes. We'd appreciate you if you subscribe to us on iTunes. And please rate us because we haven't had a rating for a while, and that would be great. Yes, absolutely. It helps, it helps uh, people find our show, so that would definitely help out. So you, this is a way you could help us, and we definitely appreciate it. Absolutely. And uh, Jesse, where can they find you? So I am on Twitter at Jesse Jackson DFW. Uh, I am also on um, Facebook, Jesse Jackson in Louisville, Texas. Uh, you can hear me. Uh, we are doing a American Gods podcast, uh, Roadside Attractions, on this SMG network, and we're having a great time yep. talking about that series. Loving um, that series. It, I am loving that series so much. This may be one of my favorite adaptions from a book. It It is just – they're taking everything that I loved about the book and being faithful to it, but also giving its own twists. And so I, I like that a lot. Um, my, wife, and, my wife Lori is not really digging American Gods, I should point out. Okay. Yeah, so I love the show. She's not digging the show, and I, I was, I'm kind of disappointed, really. It's, um, it's a very – it's a very grown-up fantasy series. I thought Game of Thrones was grown-up. This is carrying it even a little bit better, right? I think uh, so. I yeah, think, I, think, I think I think it's just it's it's pure Neil Gaiman, which yeah. is always always a good thing in my opinion. Absolutely. By the way, uh, Stars had a Neil Gaiman um, documentary about his last book signing, and it was wonderful. I got to see that and talking about that. Uh, and ta- he talked a little bit about telling the stories and his process, and it was good. So um, we will – and since Neil Gaiman you know, has a very clear connection to Doctor Who, so – Right. Um, I also uh, – and then um, my set, Lusting Bruce, my Bruce Springsteen music podcast, continues to go well, and we'd love for people to check on that. And Charles, I heard you have a new podcast along yeah. with um, our old faithful. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, we've been talking about that for a while, but um, uh, in, like, uh, in a, yeah, my other two podcasts that I'm doing, uh, the Phantom Zone podcast, which I do with a uh, friend of the show, Karen Lindsay, and Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast, which I do with Zan Sprouse, um, that. Uh, we, Zan and I are actually having a little Twin Peaks party tonight for the premiere of Twin Peaks, the return of Twin Peaks at long Yay. last. And the Showtime's been doing marathon all day and of Twin Peaks episodes. So um, gearing up for that. Definitely looking forward to that. We're going to, I'm going to go, we're going to, Lori and I are going to go over to Zan and Chris Sprouse's house. Oh, nice. The Sprouse house. And uh, we're going to watch the premiere. And so Ghostwood United, y'all. And uh, looking forward to that. So hopefully I'll post some pictures about, you know, as our viewing party. And uh, yeah, please check out. It'll be episode six, which will be we're going to record this Thursday. So if you're curious about that, uh, please check out Ghostwood episode six coming soon. Good. Very nice. 
All right. So, um, and also, if you want to reach me, you can reach me at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine, at Charles Skaggs on the Instagram. Google Plus for all you crazy kids on the Google Plus. Mm -hmm. Facebook, of course. And my blog of geeky things. If I, whoop, I gotta get rid of the email here. Uh, all right. Uh, damn good coffee. And hot. Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about Next Stop Everywhere, Doctor Who, and all kinds of comics and sci-fi goodness, including, uh, you know, The Phantom Zone and Ghostwood. So uh, please check that out, and I would definitely appreciate it. Good. Very nice. Um, so uh, what do we got next week? Part next two, week, right? Yeah, part two, The Pyramid at the End of the World, which is a great Doctor Who title in my opinion. It is. Um, it's written by Peter Harness, who wrote the rather horrible Kill the Moon with Stephen Moffat, mm. but also wrote the really great The Zygon Invasion slash The Zygon Inversion. Ooh, yes. So, yeah, hopefully we get that Peter Harness and not the earlier Peter Harness. Yes. And But he's also writing, co-writing it with Stephen Moffat, so we'll see where this goes. All right. But that's, that's part two next week. Very cool. Well, Charles, as always, this was a blast. I uh, love talking about it. Thank you helping me get through it's this kind do you feel, of do you feel a little do you feel a little better about the episode after we talked it out? I do. I feel a lot better about it. I also it helps me um that you understood my feelings. You didn't think I was just kind of saying I had expectations and so I'm glad. I'm very glad. Yes. That's, you know, I'm cool with you know how you feel. I don't want to be. I don't expect everybody to feel like I do about Doctor Who. So yes. I res, I try to respect other people's opinions. Absolutely. Well, and you you were you're holding my hand, and I appreciate it. <laughs> so uh, you don't need me to hold your hand. Uh, yes. You're, um, you've been, we've been doing this long enough. We're at episode eighty three here, so you we are. You don't, you don't need you don't need your hand held anymore. Yes. All right. All right. Um. So. so uh, with that, we'll uh, see you guys next week. Do we have a quote, Jesse? I do not have a quote this week. I was going to oh. use uh, the River this Song gasping, quote. Gasping I know. I was going to use the River Song quote. Yeah. And uh, and then I you used from, it. Did stole... yes. And okay. so I was like, oh, so uh, I've been kind of searching for something that fits, and I don't have it. So uh, next time I'll do better. All right. All I'm right. sorry. I stole it straight no, it was a great quote. So uh, thank you. Told me what it done. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, next time we'll see you next time. All Episode right. 84, the pyramid at the end of the world. Write us more, Holly. Back and everybody else, write in too. Yes, indeed. And we'll see you next time right here on Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. Bye, everyone. Bye. Great.